good afternoon and the uh, Information Policy Census and National Ar Archives Subcommittee uh, will now come to order. And uh, without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. Without objection, members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. I welcome to today's hearing on strengthening the National Historical Publications and Records Commission uh, because we have a long list of witnesses today who will talk about the specifics of the commission. Okay. If, if you could provide, I mean, obviously we want them as soon as possible. We want to proceed with the hearing. We've got important information to, re to review. But that simply shouldn't happen. Will, I've noted yeah. it. And, and, and let me apologize for the delay in it. Uh, and we, and uh, we will follow the rules. And, we, and this won't happen again. I, I appreciate the chairman's, uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Let, let Thank me, you. I do have a, have a statement. I'll, Go I'll ahead. proceed, proceed with, with the statement. Um, Mr. Chairman, our economy is reeling, jobs are scarce, and many Americans are frustrated that Washington isn't listening to loud calls for belt tightening, tightening and fiscal restraint. And just like families that are forced to cut back on good things like music lessons or a vacation, Congress is also expected to cut programs, however mer mer meritorious, that are not essential to the core mission of our federal government. The federal government. And I need to emphasize that because, quite frankly, we can't be all things to all people. We're trying to be. But we're more than $13 trillion in debt. We're paying more than $660 million a day just in interest. That's just our interest payment. We're not meeting the basic needs of our federal government. And the question and the concern with the bill and some of the, 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 some of the things that I've heard discussed before this is expanding. Bush administration that led to the greatest deficit that we've seen uh, in our lifetimes because we were set on a path that was going straight down when we walked in the door. But this isn't about that. This is about preserving our history because it's so critically important to the culture of communities across the United States. We do have a responsibility to preserve that culture. We do have a responsibility to speak to our history so that we don't make the mistakes in the future of repeating past mistakes. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I would strongly disagree with my colleague from Utah. Wait, wait. I believe the NHPRC is critically important. I support its funding, and I'm pleased uh, that you're having the hearing today, and I look forward to hearing from our well, Will the gentleman yield to, so I can, will the gentleman yield? I, if, you can always reclaim your time if you don't like the direction I'm going. The gentleman did not yield. Does any other wit, does any one of the member prefer to make an opening statement? Yes, you are. Three minutes. Yes, sir. I would yield the balance of my time to the ranking member. Thank, Thank you. you. To, to clarify, to answer the gentleman's question, I campaign on the very idea that Republicans have the House, the Senate, and the presidency, and they blew it. I was, I did look back in retrospect and said, yeah, what we did in Iraq was wrong. And I questioned the president in the move in Afghanistan. So to help clarify the record, yeah, I've been very critical, even when it says the word Bush. I don't think I've been even in my principles. Let me also clarify here that the National Archives and Records Administration budget, uh, uh, proposed budget for, for fiscal year 2010 is roughly $467 million. The National Endowments for the Humanities is roughly $167 million. And the Institute for Museum and Library Services is roughly $240 million for a total of roughly $874 million. Now somehow we're gonna have to survive on that kind of money. What to, what's being proposed is to increase that even more. At the same time, you have President Obama, you have the OMB director calling for a 5% cut. A 5% across the board cut. Let me read this real quickly. This is from uh, Director Orzak, just June 8th. Quote, the bottom line is we do not have the luxury of simply spending more. We must continually review all spending and make sure every dollar addresses a clear need or problem. We can no longer afford the old way of doing business here in Washington, D.C. As described below, the president is asking for a renewed effort to go through your budget line by line with a critical eye to target programs that are not the best use of taxpayer dollars. We still have hundreds of millions of dollars allocated to 
preserving the, de the needed records. One last thing, Mr. Chairman, and I will conclude. And on the page two of the Director Orzag's 5% target, your agency should identify discretionary programs or sub-programs that constitute at least a 5% of your agency's fiscal year 2000 discretionary appropriations as enacted. And, but what we're talking about here is a doubling. So I think, it, ironically enough, I'm being consistent with the President and the OMB Director. And I think the gentleman from Ohio and others should answer as to why they think, in this economic peril that we're in, why they can justify doubling a budget. Doubling. And, 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 and Mr. Chaffetz, and, the, and the, the, uh, the order was to look at programs in agencies that were uh, uh, duplicitous and that were, uh, that were wasteful. And, and I'm sure that, that those agencies will be able to find some cuts. Uh, let's, um, let's move towards the uh, testimony of the witnesses. I, I'd now like to introduce our first panel. Uh, and our first witness will be the Honorable John Larson, member of Congress from the great state of Connecticut. Uh, Congressman Larson has honorably served the people of the first district of Connecticut since 1999 and is the chair of the Democratic Caucus. Congressman Larson has been an active and enthusiastic member of the NHPRC since 2007. Our next witness is archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. Mr. Ferriero has led the National Archives since its confirmation last November. And Mr. Ferriero previously served as the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the New York Public Library, the largest public library system in the United States. Uh, we will then hear from Ms. Kathleen Williams, who has been Executive Director of the NHPRC since 2008 after serving as Deputy Director for four years. Uh, she previously spent over 20 years as an archivist. Uh, I thank all of our witnesses for appearing today and look forward to their testimonies. Uh, I know this is your first visit, Ms. Williams, and we, we are not as ferocious as we may seem. Uh, we will begin uh, by swearing. It is the policy of the uh, committee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. Would you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you, and you may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative, and we will try to get through uh, each witness's testimony before we uh, recess. Uh, Honorable Mr. Larson, you may proceed. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Clay. I really appreciate the opportunity to testify before you. and. Ranking member for the day, Mr. Chaffetz, uh, my distinguished colleague, Mr. Driehaus uh, from Ohio, Mr. Jordan as well. Uh, thank you for affording uh, me the opportunity to come and address uh, uh, the committee today on what I believe is an extraordinary important issue for the uh, country, uh, for the nation, and uh, one that uh, I want to commend from the outset, uh, Chairman Clay. Uh, Chairman Clay has recognized the traditional underfunding uh, that has taken place in such a vital aspect of our nation's history and its culture. Um, I am a strong supporter, in fact the co-sponsor of H.R. Uh, 1556, because I don't believe the decisions that confront us as have been enumerated both by Mr. Driehaus and by Mr. Chaffetz, while they are important uh, in terms of how we look at what we're assigned to do in the United States Conference, Congress, it's not a question of whether it's big government or smaller government. It's a question of how efficient the government is that we provide for the people. And so as your responsibility and ours all collectively is, is to examine the budgets in our committees and to make sure that what we're producing carries with it the most beneficial and effective use of money uh, that we can find. It's long been noted and I will, uh, if I can, Mr. Chairman, I will uh, seek permission to revise and extend my remarks, uh, submit extraneous uh, 
information and summarize, if I will, because I think it's best to summarize this around an, uh, an age-old debate. And one best uh, articulated by Daniel Borston, who was the Librarian of Congress. Now, Borston was very concerned about the, well, at the time he called it the year of the book. And what was happening in terms of literacy, what was happening in terms of the confluence of technology and literacy, and what was happening, in fact, and I think every member of Congress, and I dare say everyone in the audience can appreciate this, the differentiation between information and knowledge. It used to be commonplace that we would say, we want our, it to be an informed citizenry. And yet it's hard, I think, for anyone to turn on a TV screen today and not see a messages screaming across the bottom of the screen while you're getting direct news, while you're getting the forecast, while there's another sub-column over here, 24-7 cable. Clearly, Americans are informed, but are they more knowledgeable? And so when we look at our great institutions, including the National Archives, the Library of Congress, these institutions become, for a democracy and a culture, a fortress of knowledge, differentiating between the information, and especially in this day and age when everything is instant now and everywhere, they become the storehouse of knowledge that allows the American citizen to peruse not only present and future, but everywhere in the past at their leisure. And that's why these primary documents, and whether they be the documents and the comments and the opening comments at today's uh, committee hearing, whether they be floor statements, whether they be historic in nature, we, by virtue of the plethora of great Americans that have made contributions to this nation, they do indeed become vitally important. Mr. Treehouse accounted for in his statements the need especially for our states and our municipalities and the need for us if we are to be that beacon of light around the world to lead intelligently and effectively with who we are as a people. It's one thing to talk about democracy, freedom, and liberal liberty. It's another thing to, for all cultures, but most importantly, our culture, our people, our citizens, to have the kind of exposure that they need to the great gift of knowledge historic preservation and records that aren't just instant now and everywhere, but are the culmination of a nation's history, of a people, of humanity in general. And I would submit that that is the great strength of our country, our national archive system, our library, which is second to none in the world. If we were to bring about the kind of change that we would all like to see around the world, there can be no more effective use of money spent by this Congress than in making sure that that great and ennobling message and is able to reach beyond our borders, but most importantly, within our borders, to educate our children and future generations, to develop our scholars, to put, in fact, our scholars at work. The National Archives were born out of the effort of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in a time far more difficult than what we face today. But they saw the necessity in investing in the nation's history and making sure that we not only preserved it,
but also use this going forward as a beacon of hope, not only for our country, but as we have seen, has served this nation extraordinarily well. I want to commend you, Mr. Clay. I wholeheartedly support your uh, legislation. I thank the committee for an opportunity to uh, speak here this afternoon. I apologize uh, that, uh, as the chairman knows, we have a, uh, a uh, caucus that's going, and I guess concurrent with votes that will be taking place on the floor as well. And I thank uh, all of my colleagues for the opportunity to speak before you today. I thank the witness for his appearance, and you are dismissed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ferriero, you may proceed. Chairman Clay and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to participate in this hearing on the National Historic Historic Publications and Records Commission, which is especially timely since today is International Archives Day. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for introducing the reauthorization bill, and I would also like to thank Congressman Larson for being here today and for ably representing the House as a voting member on NHPRC. While the National Archives is a steward of federal records, the National Historic Publications and Records Commission augments that work by awarding competitive matching grants that help preserve and make accessible a much wider variety of important historical records that tell our American story. As Archivist of the United States, I serve as Chair of the Commission. It's a responsibility that I'm honored to have, and I say this as one who for the past three decades in the library profession has witnessed firsthand the power of these modest grants to encourage and leverage a wide variety of archival projects. The Commission's membership is drawn from executive, judicial, and legislative branches of the federal government and from professional associations of historians, editors, and archivists. It rigorously reviews and competitively selects projects each year that preserve historical documents and make them available to all Americans. The most difficult part of this process is that we must cast aside more excellent grant applications than we're able to fund. In my written testimony, I provided a few examples of grants at work and I could provide many hundreds of examples from every state in the country. Of course, each and every NHPRC grant is important to the people, institutions, and communities on the receiving end. However, the ultimate grant beneficiaries are future generations of Americans who will continue to learn from the history we are helping to discover, preserve, and make accessible. NHPRC grants, however, can also make records available in ways that have a dramatic impact on the lives of ordinary citizens today. A grant from NHPRC to Texas Tech established the Vietnam Archives Families of Vietnamese Political Prisoners Association collection, which helps Vietnamese refugees immigrate to the United States. In June 2009, a former Vietnamese re-education camp prisoner was able to obtain political asylum in the United States by using the documents found in this collection to prove his case. Another area where NHPRC support is making a difference is helping states and localities expand access to digitized records on the web. Virtually every archives, museum, and library is struggling to meet these challenges of so many records, so much public demand, and so few resources to make them easily accessible. In electronic records, those created as digital files increase the scale, cost, and complexity of the problem. It's a challenge we are acutely aware of with federal records at the National Archives, and it's a challenge we share with every state, city, county, and town across the nation. I will be, at the, I will be the first to admit that we do not have all the answers here in Washington. Through the NHPRC, however, we're able to fu fund innovative projects that contribute to a shared base of knowledge on best practices for creating, preserving, and providing access to electronic records. All of us in the federal government are very aware of the constrained budget environment. I would only add that the equally difficult budget situations in most states are having a troubling impact on state and local archival programs. I would argue that the preservation of our historical records across the nation is as important in tough economic times as it is in prosperous times. And support from NHPRC is particularly crucial in leveraging resources from states and the private sector. Since NHPRC award amounts are usually matched one to one, and also in originating and sustaining jobs for archivists and researchers. Through its grants program, the NHPRC fulfills Congress's vision for national leadership to preserve and make accessible our nation's rich documentary heritage. 
School children use these documents in their study of history. Citizens use these documents to discover their own heritage and to affirm their basic rights. And storytellers use these documents to write new chapters in the American story. From the award-winning historical biography of John Adams to the PBS series on the Civil War and America's National Parks, all are made possible through our support of the original documents in our nation's archives. I know there are several individuals and organizations testifying today in support of your legislation. With my testimony, I also am, in, am including several letters from organizations that are not present here today, but wanted their support to be included in this hearing record. Thank you again for the opportunity to appear before you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Ferriero. And we will suspend now with, with witness testimony, uh, and the subcommittee will recess and reconvene uh, immediately after these series of votes.